Hello, my name is Kerr fakrell -Jean, and this is Defying Archival Silence in a Chicago Suburb Founded by an Enslaver, Chicago Open Archives 2021. Why should we study local history? Here are some articulate reasons from the Ohio Local History Alliance. Local history reflects the reality that our lives are shaped by particular places and that our physical place in the world is a major determinant to how our lives are lived. Local history is the study of the everyday struggles and triumphs of ordinary people. The study of local topics allows for in-depth research to connect the past with the present, which is done more simply and with more meaning than studying the national faceless masses. It allows for greater depth in studying the history of our communities and the relations to the people within them. The suburb I'm going to talk about is LaGrange, Illinois. This is a Tyke postcard from the Kurt Tyke Postcard Archive at Newberry Library. And as you can see from the train featured prominently, it is a railroad suburb. LaGrange is a village of 16,000 people in Western Cook County, Lyons Township. The median income for a family most recently is $95,554. There's train service to Chicago and there has been since the 1860s. It takes about 35 minutes. Many residents commute for work. And the area was first quote unquote settled in the 1830s. But of course it's Native American Potawatomi history goes back much further and there is room for much more research on the Native American history of the area. In the 2000 census, the village was 6% African American. The east side of LaGrange, east of Bluff Avenue, has historically been home to most of the African American residents of LaGrange. Some early residents of the area were servants to wealthier white families. And the Community Diversity Group, which is a great organization in LaGrange, is looking at the history of redlining in LaGrange's real estate history. The LaGrange Area Historical Society can be found online at lagrangehistory.org. It was founded in 1972, and the Society has an archive of files on every house in LaGrange with clippings from local and Chicago newspapers on the residents. They also have some files on schools and organizations and a large collection of historical clothing and other ephemera. And they put on historical tours and have other special events. They have several black history folders with clippings on various projects related to LaGrange's African-American residents, organizations, and history. However, there are no clippings in the house files from the Chicago Defender, which has recently been fully digitized and is searchable and contains many more articles on LaGrange residents from the past century on through current times. What is archival silence? I'm most familiar with it from Rodney G.S. Carter's 2006 paper of Things Said and Unsaid, Power Archival Silences and Power in Silence, which was published in the Canadian journal Archivaria in 2006. To summarize very briefly, Carter explains how the absence of individuals or groups from the archive can be a form of violence and suggests that archivists should extend the invitation to all groups into the archive while recognizing that some groups may choose to remain silent. Which brings up the questions for me, what silences exist in, LaGrange, in the LaGrange Historical Society's archive? What about the African-American and other minority residents? What about the town's earliest residents? Now, the official histories of LaGrange all talk about its founding by this man, F.D. Cossett. He was an enslaver in Tennessee before he came north to Chicago. 
and I am going to talk more about his history. This was a portrait of him from around 1860. Cossett bought 600 acres in Western Cook County in 1870 and named the area Kensington, but there was already a Kensington, Illinois post office, so he named it LaGrange after his previous home in Tennessee. He subdivided the area that became LaGrange starting in 1871, and the village was incorporated in 1879 with Cossett as its first president. From an early biographical sketch in a book of prominent Cook County, Illinois citizens, Cossett is referred to as this. He is sagacious and farsighted, straightforward and honorable in all dealings. His investments have proved judicious and through the legitimate channels of business, he has won his fortune. His habits have always been temperate and his successful life should serve as an example and inspiration to every ambitious young man. Now there is some archival silence around this fact, but the fact is that Cossett owned slaves. How many? His Chicago Tribune obituary said 61. That biographical sketch from which I just read from 1894 said 160. The slave schedule of the 1850 U.S. Census said 15. By the time of the slave schedule of the 1860 Census, it said 125. He testified to the Southern Claims Commission under oath in 1876 that he owned 127 enslaved people. Now bear with me on this timeline. I worked with someone at the Newberry Library who said that anytime they start talking about old white guys, my eyes glaze over. So I'll try to make this brief. In 1821, he was born in Granby, Connecticut. His father died in 1834 and 35. 1836, he moves to LaGrange, Tennessee to work with his uncle in a store. In 1842, he separates from his uncle and goes into business for himself. He marries his first wife in 1844, Martha Malone of Virginia, by whom he has five children, three of whom live to adulthood. And 1850, he's listed on the slave schedule of the United States Census as owning 15 enslaved people in Tennessee. The slave schedule of the census was done in 1850 and 1860. It doesn't give the names of the slaves, but it does give their ages and whether they were male or female. In 1853, his second wife, Martha Malone Cossett dies, sorry, his first wife, Martha Malone Cossett dies, and he marries Martha Moore, so many Marthas. He has uh, five more children by her, and uh, th again, three survive to adulthood. Around 1856, he tells his enslaved person, William Cossett, that he will be free soon. However, he did not free him. And this is a portrait of Cossett from around 1850. In 1860, he's listed on the slave schedule of the census as owning 125 enslaved people in Tennessee and Mississippi. In 1862, when the Union Army comes to his home in southwestern Tennessee. He tells the Union General that the rebel the Union generals that the rebel forces don't amount to much. And the following year he takes an oath of allegiance to the United States and moves to Chicago. His second wife Martha Moore Cossett dies the same year. And in 1863 to uh, 1875 he owns Barrett and Cossett and later Cossett and Company, which were wholesale grocers and later a uh, real estate company in Chicago. Here's a picture of the building that Cossett and Company was in. You see the sign F.D. Cossett and Company there on the right above the first floor of the building. And this was at Michigan and Randolph, which then as now was a very ritzy address. In 1864, he marries a wealthy Chicago widow, Addie C. Hedges Hunt. 
and in 1869 buys 80 acres of land and establishes the town of Montrose, Illinois. I can't find much document, documentary evidence about that, um, but it is mentioned in his Tribune obituary. Around 1870 to 71, he buys 600 acres in Western Cook County, and in 1871, subdivides LaGrange, Illinois. On October 8, 1871, is the Great Chicago Fire. He loses the grocery business and um, is in a good position to bounce back. In 1875, he moves to LaGrange, Illinois and builds his home there. And 1876 is the main year I'm gonna be talking about. He testified to the Southern Claims Commission in Washington, DC and was awarded $14,102 for his losses during the Civil War. It's kind of problematic to give uh, an idea of what that amount of money would be in today's terms. Probably hundreds of thousands of dollars. In 1878, he testifies in the Alvaro Clark murder trial, also known as the Clark St. Peter murder trial. It was a murder in LaGrange in the fall, in the summer of 1878. And then uh, in the fall and winter, it captivated the imagination of Chicago because it was so heavily covered in the Chicago Tribune. In 1879, LaGrange, Illinois was incorporated with Cossett as its village president. And in 1900, he died by suicide in LaGrange. Cossett's enslaving is either not mentioned or is downplayed in the Images of America book on LaGrange and LaGrange Park, Illinois, which came out in 1999. That book makes almost no reference to the African-American history of LaGrange, and it was criticized as such at the time. The Wikipedia article makes no mention of Cossett as a slaveholder. The LaGrange Historical Society's webpage makes no mention of Cossett as a slaveholder, but it is mentioned in his Tribune obituary and notably in a blog post from one of his descendants who wrote about the Southern Claims Commission file. That was in 2006. There has been a growing movement to rename things named after enslavers. 30 public schools in Chicago are named for slaveholders. Surprised CPS promises changes was an article in the Sun-Times last December. However, I ask, what about things named after loyal slaveholders? Does that make it more problematic? As in, does it make it more complex when the question is about a slaveholder who helped the Union, as Cossett did. We have Cossett Avenue in LaGrange, one of the main east-west streets that runs the entire length of the town. There's Cossett Elementary School, which they say all the, all the schools in LaGrange are named after streets. So it's really named after the street, Cossett Avenue School, but on the building, it is prominently listed as Cossett School. So now I'll talk a bit about the Southern Claims Commission, which was a commission established by the federal government in 1871 to compensate loyal Southerners for their assistance to the Union during the Civil War. Claimants were not compensated directly for slaves or cotton, but they were for whatever else the Union Army may have taken from them, whatever they had receipts for, which in Cossett's case was a lot. He saved his receipts. Frank W. Klingberg has a book, The Southern Claims Commission, which came out in 1955. And in 1994, there was an inventory published of all the Southern Claims Commission cases. There were thousands of cases across the country and Cossetts was the second largest award in the country, being $14,000. In 
You can read the file at fold3.com, which is a genealogical website with mainly military records. The claim files are organized by state and county, and Cossack's file is about a, a 390 pages. It has scans of the original receipts given by soldiers, handwritten affidavits, handwritten letters about the claim from witnesses, and a handwritten transcript of the testimony in his hearings before the commission in 1876. To summarize the claim, he was claiming $31,000 in losses. The commission allowed only $14,000 of that. Among the items which were allowed, he was given $4,000 for mules, 32 mules at $125 each, $2,270 for livestock, hogs, beeves, and cattle, and $1,612.50 for corn, which was 3,750 bushels of corn. So that's way, way less than even a dollar a bushel. 30 cents a bushel, roughly, 20 cents a bushel something like that. Here's a list from the file of uh, the things that Cossett was claiming from November 1862. Mules, fodder, hay, corn, corn from the field, corn from the cribs, sweet potatoes, fat hogs, beef cattle, brown sugar, and so on. Cossett's testimony to the commission is about half the file, about 160 pages, and four witnesses testified. Cossett himself, Stephen A. Hurlbut, who was a Union general who commanded at LaGrange, Tennessee, and later was a member of Congress from Illinois. Edward M. Myrick, who was one of the overseers on Cossett's plantations. And William Cossett, who was a former slave of Cossett's, who described himself as Cossett's businessman or foreman. Here is a picture of what that handwritten transcript looks like. It might be kind of hard to read at that magnification, but magnified, it's pretty easy to read. It's pretty clear handwriting. And it was pretty easy for me to transcribe it. So from Cossett's testimony, he's asked, did you own slaves? Yes, sir, 127 of them. What was the amount of your capital invested in them? He says, I hardly know. It was a general stock. I kept a little of everything. That phrase comes back later in his testimony when he's asked about the store that he opened in Tennessee in 1842. What kind of store was it? General stock. I kept a little of everything. And there's the store in LaGrange, Tennessee. And that figure at the center of the photo in a top hat with a beard is believed to be Cossett himself. Further in his testimony, was your business very prosperous there? Very. What property did you become the owner of there? State the whole thing. I went on merchandising and commenced buying land and Negroes and planting. Later, you have stated you had 127 slaves. What were they worth? This time when he's asked, he does put a dollar value on it. I suppose about $1,000 a piece at that time. A little bit on Tennessee unionism. Cossett was a Tennessee unionist. He's asked, who did you vote for in 1860? Bell and Everett. Were they considered union men or secessionists in that part of the country? Union men. Now, this was the election of 1860 in which Abraham Lincoln, the Republican, won. John Bell and Edward Everett from Tennessee and Massachusetts, respectively, were the nominees of the Constitutional Union Party, which won three states, including Tennessee, and 39 electoral votes. Unionism was more prevalent in East Tennessee than it was in West Tennessee, where LaGrange was. In his testimony, Cossett says his area in Southwest Tennessee near the Mississippi line was strongly secessionist. 
However, he names many Union men who may have been afraid to identify, identify themselves publicly as such. Cossett and other Union men opposed the burning of cotton, which the Confederates wanted to do so it would not fall into the hands of the Union army. Confederate troops burned 260-odd bales of Cossett's cotton, roughly 125,000 pounds, worth well more than $100,000. Cossett had four plantations, the Myrick Place, 1,000 acres, 700 in cultivation, the Urquhart Place, 1,650 acres, 1,000 in cultivation, the Sykes Place, 800 acres, 400 in cultivation, and the Adams Place, 300 acres, 100 in cultivation. If you're a city slicker like me and you don't know much about how big an acre is, that amount of land, 3,750 acres, and 2,200 in cultivation would be almost six square miles, of which almost three square miles would be in cultivation by 127 slaves. Or to give another idea of scale, the total amount of land was about 3,000 football fields and the amount in cultivation would be about 1,500 football fields. That was Cossett's house in LaGrange, Tennessee. It was called Tiara. Hurlbut, the former general, when he was a general, wrote this letter on behalf of Cossett. Gentlemen, Mr. F.D. Cossett of LaGrange is, I think, a reliable Union man. I have so considered him for a year. You will find him so in your experience. I trust he will receive kindly treatment at your hand. Yours truly, S.A. Hurlbut. Major General, November 23rd, 1862. He testifies more uh, in, uh, in greater detail about Cossett's loyalty when he testifies to the Claims Commission. Mr. Cossett was among the first of the men in that region of the country who came out openly and avowedly when the army came there as a Union man and so declared himself to me at once and to my officers, and I found upon inquiry that he was so considered by the people there before we came. He was under a cloud. That section of Tennessee along the line of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad was bitterly secession. The region of north of it up above was very much more divided in sentiment. From all the means of information I could get at that time, and it was my business to know, I was advised that he was distinguished as a union man and has always been loyal to the government. He gave us a great deal of important information and his conduct was so marked by his known fidelity to the Union that when I was about to move on from, from LaGrange to Memphis, there was no probability that the troops would be retained there. Mr. Cossack considered it necessary, and I have no doubt it was, for him to leave the country and he went, I think, immediately to Chicago. Hurlbut's testimony is very valuable for the amount of detail it gives on the military campaign at that time. LaGrange was used as a staging ground for the attack on Vicksburg, which ended up happening in the summer of 1863 and um, was a very important uh, campaign. His overseer, Edward M. Myrick's testimony, he says he was born about 1820, testifies he could not write. He was able to sign his name, which I will show you. In 1876, he was living on land bought from Cossett, including the place on which he was overseer before the war. Much of his testimony involves his recollection about the taking of mules by the Union Army in 1862. The mules were worth $125 each. And Myrick and men like him are the subject of Carrie Lee Merritt's book, Masterless Men, which you may be familiar with. There's his signature, E.M. Myrick. Not very good handwriting there, but he was able to write his name. And the next person to testify is William Cossett, who was a slave, and this was an affidavit he filed and he signs his name with an X. It says, William Cossett, his mark, and it has the X there. Cossett is referred to in affidavits and the transcript as William Cossett colored. His age in 1876 was 41 or 42, between that, born 1834 or 35. 
His first enslaver was Haller Haji, second enslaver was Jack Bailey of Tennessee, and Bailey sold him to Cossett around 1846 when he was 11 or 12 years old. He lived on Cossett's Urquhart Place since 1856. He's asked, did you hold any position or office on the plantation? I attended to business for him. Were you overseer? No, sir, I was just what I call businessman, seed to everything. Did they ever call you foreman or anything? Yes, sir, I was a foreman. He testifies he cannot read or write. He's been married 10 or 12 years, was married before the war. Answers questions about the Urquhart plantation, how the soldiers used it and what they took from it. Says he heard there were 40,000 troops there. Says they had 52 hands on the Urquhart plantation, which you'll remember was a thousand acres in cultivation, including 25 hoe hands, little chaps half grown, some of them. That was who was laboring in those huge fields. Myrick inter interrupts William Cossett's testimony to say there were 600 acres of corn on that plantation. William Cossett's testimony is further about the number of mules taken, when he saw them taken, who took them, and how many were taken. He says 30. He says the soldiers did not leave a single mule. Testifies about the number of hogs taken. He's asked, how do you, how do you know about these hogs? Did you take care of them? Yes, sir. You yourself took care of them? Yes, sir, I did. I attended to them every morning and every night. Did you feed them yourself? Yes, sir, I fed them myself. Didn't you have other men to do the work for you? Do the work for me? No, sir, I fed them myself. I attended the, to them myself. How many cattle did you have in all there? 90 head of cattle in all. They haven't got but 66 charge. What became of the rest? Well, there was 90 head of cattle, that is sure. I should like to know how you could remember there was 90 head. How can I remember? Well, I can remember that I've got my thumbs onto my hands. Well, it is a different thing about cows and cattle. I had them there to attend to, and I suppose that was my business, and I was as regular to do it as you are to sit down here writing with your pen. Ninety head? Yes, sir, ninety head of cattle. Of course you didn't count them, did you? I expect I ought to have counted them to attend to my business if I had business to attend to. Now the question is this, I don't want to deal unfairly with your memory, but I still want to know how you came to remember. Well, I kept it in my mind. If I does anything like that, I keep it in my mind, and once in a while I go back and look over it, what I done, as near as I can, but I ain't been doing it regularly like I used to do it. When I was tending to business, I kept all these things perfect in my mind so that I should not be bothered. After I laid down nights, I would be studying over it. Later, he's asked, were any of Mr. Cossett's servants in the Union Army? Yes, sir, nearly all of them. Did he ever try to prevent them? No, sir. He told me it would happen five years before it happened. I told him it would not be so. He told me I would be free after a while. I told him, no, it would not be so. I told him I did not expect to see, I told him I didn't expect to live to see it. And he said, if you die, it will be so anyhow and you will come to see the day that your children and my children will play together. He told me that five years before, but I didn't believe it. Later, when the commission is giving its summary of the claim, they write this. Myrick testifies that once on the road, he met 22 mules of claimants that had been taken from the Urquhart place, and that with 10 taken from Myrick's, would leave just the 32. It may be doubted whether Myrick would distinguish between mules from Urquhart's or the other plantations. William Cossett's testimony that they took 30 in all from the Urquhart place is testimony as to numbers, in which respect we cannot much rely on colored men's testimony after so long a lapse of time. Defying archival silence. The LaGrange Area Historical Society has a copy of Cossett's Southern Claims Commission file on CD-ROM, which is not a very usable format now that computers are coming without CD-ROM drives. The resistance of the Historical Society generally and descendants of Cossett's particularly to address, explore, and wrestle with Cossett's role as an enslaver creates archival silence and does not help address the substantial archival silence that exists around LaGrange's and the United States African-American history. 
Cossett's fortune was made with African-American labor. I have found no evidence he ever saw anything wrong with cotton planting as a way of making money, though he apparently did recognize in the 1850s that slavery would end soon and that African-American children and white children would someday play together, as they do. I'll close with this letter from W.T. Sherman. General Sherman, well known for the burning of Atlanta, and um, he is probably the most famous person to be represented in Cossett's file. His handwriting is hard to read, but the best I could make out of it was this. Sir, the bearer F.D. Cossett will take charge of the two something of trestle work and will manage those Negroes and teams. He is interested in having the work done well and quickly, work well done and quickly. Please give him all the help possible in mechanical tools and teams. I commend him to your attention as a gentleman of high reputation in this community. I am W.T. Sherman, Major General. So we still have Cossett Avenue, we still have Cossett School in 2021. And I uh, hope that this talk has uh, given you uh, some uh, questions to think about in that regard. This has been De Defying Archival Silence in a Chicago suburb founded by an enslaver. I'm Kerr Fackrell Dean. If you have any questions or additional research you would like to share with me, my email address is classiccare at gmail.com. This has been Chicago Open Archives for the Chicago Area Archivists, and it was finished on October 25th, 2021. I'd like to thank Tom Hayden, Chuck Brand, David Wallace, Sarah Parks, Mark Truax, Martha Briggs, the LaGrange Area Historical Society, the Tennessee Historical Society, and the Newberry Library. Thank you for watching.